It's a Roth and retirement investing megasode. Today on Your Money, Your Wealth podcast number 463. We're revisiting your favorite YMYW topics and derails of 2023 based on downloads and views on our most popular platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Safe investing when you're risk averse, mutual funds versus ETFs, stable value funds, and estimating retirement income needs when you're a young saver with a pension made the YMYW best of 2023 on the investing side. On the Roth side, what to do when there's too much money in your traditional IRA, whether Roth conversions are really as good as they sound, and who's right about the Roth conversion strategy, our listener or his advisor. Check the description of this mega episode to jump directly to any question, to see which episode each question originally comes from, and to see where it was most popular. I'm producer Andy Last with the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson CFP, and Big Al Clopine CPA. And first up is a voice message. They always get priority here on YMYW. Hi, Joe, Al, and Andy. This is Tyler from Ohio. It's been a couple years since I've called in, but I have a new situation that I was hoping to get your thoughts on. This involves my parents, who I would say are highly risk averse people. In 2009, they took all of their retirement accounts out of the market, despite significant penalty and loss, and turned to real estate which my father has been doing all his life. They are now in their late 70s and have just sold the last rental property that they have because it's time for them to get out. It's just too much for them to handle anymore. So they are sitting on about $400,000, which I would consider cash because it is in a bank savings account earning 0.1% interest. So just in our discussions with what they want to do with the money, they are not sure but they know they don't want to lose it. So I suggested they at least look at maybe an online savings account or perhaps some CDs so that they get a little yield versus 0.1%. And then they went to their bank, which of course they've been banking with for 30 years to ask about other accounts that they have and came home with annuity brochures, which was very frustrating on my part. But in terms of their monthly income, their pensions and Social Security bring about $8,000 a month, which completely cover their monthly expenses. So I don't think they need an income stream of any sort, but I wanted to get your thoughts on what are kind of the appropriate investments they need to be considering if their goal is really just to protect this money and not necessarily to grow it. Love listening to the podcast. I do so in my Toyota minivan with my children. I usually have to turn the podcast up pretty loud to cover their complaints for mom listening to the podcast again. But I will say that my 17-year-old who just got his first job this year came home and asked me if I could help him set up a Roth IRA. So some of it's sinking in despite them not wanting to hear it. But love it. Thank you for all the great advice and hope to hear from you. Wow. That's that's a <laughs> great, great question. And uh, Tyler, we enjoyed listening to your voice and hearing your question. Yeah. 17 year old, open up a little Roth IRA. The kid's going to be a billionaire. Thanks to us. <laughs> you know it? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm trying to think, what was I doing with my kids at 17? Oh. I don't think they had earned income yet. So you weren't forcing them to listen to a podcast. That's for sure. No, <laughs> but they both have Ross now. No. All right. What do you think, Al? Um, So they went to the bank. Bank was like, hey, you want zero risk. So you should go into an annuity. Yeah, which Uh, I'm not surprised because that's the same thing has happened to me at two different banks. You could get a deferred annuity um, that's going to give you um, probably the same rates, maybe a little bit higher than a CD. Um, The income grows tax deferred when you pull the income out. Um, it's going to be ordinary income. So you don't necessarily have to annuitize it. Right. So if they want absolute guarantees, right, you know, that's an option. I don't know if it's my favorite option, but it, that's definitely an option. There's all sorts of different flavors of annuities, right? We, we kind of bash annuities on this show, right? But you know, if I'm looking at just a straight fixed deferred annuity or a multi-year guaranteed annuity, you know, that might not be a bad choice for someone that wants zero risk because you already know what they did before when they saw the, the their accounts go down. They said, screw this. I'm going to cash out, 
pay taxes, pay penalties, and I'm going to go into real estate. So that's going to hurt them more than probably a, a, a guaranteed product. Yeah, well, you bring up a good point, and that, and we probably don't talk about it enough. So annuities get a bad bad name because a lot of them are are somewhat misrepresented in terms of what you're getting, what the benefits are, what the potential rates of returns are, the the fact that it's hard to get your money out without penalty, right? But uh, and the commissions that you know people say, well, there's no there's no costs in here, but there are, there are costs, whether you know it or not. Um, so not all annuities are bad, right? But uh, I still wouldn't go that route. I, I would go personally, I would go back to the bank and just open up a, a CD that, and I've checked recently because I just opened up a CD myself last week and a, in, in a large No, you had a little bank, extra cash? A little extra cash. Yeah, that little... wallet was getting so fat. I just said it, take it over. It, like, uh, I, 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 had, I barely sit down. I had to go to the bank. I had, open to, a little CD. I had to rent a little pickup truck to get it there. So anyway, um, armored car. Yeah. Ar- ar- yeah. Armored car. Got it. So, but the rate at a, at a big, too big to fail bank was over 4% for a 13 month CD. That, that's what I would do right now. That doesn't mean it's going to be that rate forever, but at least for the next year, to me, that's a great rate. That's what I would do because you can always get at your money. And if you do take your money out early on, on something like that, interest. you lose the interest, right? So it's not necessarily the end of the world, particularly when you're used to getting 0.1 or in some cases 0.01% interest on a money market. Yeah. Um, I, I think it really depends on Tyler's parents and they're in their mid to late 70s. It sounds like they got a ton of cash flow, $8,000 yeah, right. a so month. It sounds like plenty for their living expenses. Right. And so if, if they want to lock the money up for a little bit longer, you know, they, they might be able to get a little bit higher yield yeah. um, that's guaranteed, you know, and I think they really like the, the, the guaranteed yeah, they, aspect. They, of they it. want safety. And and I think that's the, that to me, that's the one instance where you might, I might be okay with an annuity. If it's if, if it's one of the products that you just talked about, and it's for someone that wants zero risk, it can work. So um, yeah, hope that helps. But you know, CD is a good route. You know, there, there's all sorts. You could even go money market today. You in, know, in in some banks, right? Yeah, my the bank I checked and it was paying point, paying point zero three. Oh, <laughs> the so, money market there, wow. so it wasn't wasn't very good. All right, uh, thanks, Tyler. And um, good luck to your um, 17-year-old. Way to go. Good morning, Joe, Big Al, and Andy. Sharon from Waukesha. First, thank you for your podcast again. One of my faves. I'm still driving the 2016 Honda CRV. Still catering to my two rescue cats, Izzy and Baby. And I wouldn't turn down a cup or two of red wine. Hey, a couple questions around stable value funds and the and the use, the purpose of them, I guess. I have a stable value fund. It's called the annual fixed rate fund in my 401k. Other really my main question is figuring out where to pull money for living expenses in 2024. I retired at the end of 2021 and I'm currently draining all my cash as I ride out this down market. The cash runs out end of 2023. My annual expenses are about 55k. I've already rolled my 401k into an IRA, but I do have some funds in my 401k, specifically 58k in a 2030 target fund, and I have 41k in a stable value fund. It's a stable value fund that I'm really kind of looking at. Current return rate on this fund is 5%. Average return rate has been 5% or higher since inception, 1997. Zero fees associated with this stable value fund. I know. I've asked you a question about this before in the past, and you have sounded skeptical, but there are zero fees. Expense ratio as of 2022 is zero. Purchase fee, none. Redemption fee, none. 12B fee, none, unless I'm missing a hidden fee. So does it make sense to draw down on this stable value fund for living expenses in 2024, or it's just better to tap my brokerage account? Is there any value in rolling that 2013 target fund of 58K into this stable value fund and building it? Or should I just roll both funds in my 401k to my IRA and be done and start draining my brokerage account to cover expenses for the next few years? What are your thoughts really around this stable value fund? What should I do with it, especially now that savings rates are starting to rise? I currently get 4.2% for my cash savings. 
Should I be tapping it, keeping it for later, or rolling it into an IRA? Any thoughts? Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Sharon. Sounds like I was back at home. Yeah, right. You can tell that <laughs> Midwest accent. You got it. Yep, you heard that too. Uh, yeah, you betcha I did. Yeah. <laughs> you, you betcha. Okay. Couple of thoughts. So she's got multiple questions here, kind of baked into one. Yeah, she does. They're they're kind of interrelated, but there's a few different points we'll probably want to make. Maybe we should explain what's a stable value fund. Well, I think before the investment, you got to come up with a strategy. Right. Right? Yeah. And so she's drawing down cash is what she said. Yeah. I, I'm, do we know how old Sharon is? From No, and we also don't know her income. Which so we kind of need to know that she wants to live off of fifty five thousand dollars a year. So right. I don't know if she's she's claiming social security or not. I don't know if she's got a pension or not. Right. So if she's drawing cash, right, maybe she shouldn't be drawing cash. Should she be drawing from her four hundred one k at least to, you know, the top of the ten percent tax bracket? Yeah. Well. Right, exactly. I had the same thought, but we really don't know what her income is. So, so yeah. So, so the first thing you want to do is look at your taxable income to figure out what tax bracket you're you're in, and the twelve percent bracket for it. I assume she's single. She didn't mention a husband. Uh, is about forty five thousand dollars taxable income, right? Which you always get a standard deduction of uh, what's that? About thirteen thousand ish. <laughs> So let's just round it up. So income somewhere around 50000 for a single taxpayer would put you roughly at the top of the 12% bracket, roughly, right? So so then the question is, if your income is 40000 not fifty, so then you actually want to take about ten grand out of your IRA or 401k to fill up that low bracket, right? Because you're going to have to pay tax on that money anyway. So fill up that low bracket. Now, on the other hand, if she's getting big pensions... You know, maybe not because her spending is fifty five thousand, and she's got to use cash to pay for at right, least some right. of it. But if she's taking, she, it sounds like all right. I'm depleting my cash, and then now I'm going to my brokerage account, um, and then I'm going to roll this into the IRA. Oh, and by the way, I looked at this investment. Yeah, and the stable value fund is getting five percent. <laughs> Should I take it from there? Yeah. Well, you got to look at the taxation of the account, and then from there, you want to start looking at how you invest those accounts to create the income that you need, especially if you're retired. Yes, that that is the right uh, flow. Right. Yeah. So high level with the stable value fund, you know, if stable value funds are great. They're in four hundred one k's. It's kind of like a pooled investment. So if it's paying you 5%, no fees, yeah, all day long, you, you, you probably want to go into that, especially as you're transitioning into retirement. So by rolling the money out, can you get something comparable? Um, is that a word? Comparable? Comparable. 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 Thank you. <laughs> you were comparable, comparable, that works. Yeah. Yeah. It's Joe's language. Felt like I was in Waukesha. Yeah, for you're, a minute. you're between comparable <laughs> and comparable. Yes. <laughs> so sure, in today's interest rate environment, yeah. No, but it, she's got very low fees, no fees, blah, 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 blah. You want to make your life simpler? Do you want to consolidate? But I think she needs an income strategy versus an investment strategy. Right. You could buy something very comparable, like a stable value fund in your brokerage account. Now, right now it's paying four and a half, five percent. Yeah. Can you get um, something fairly safe, close to that today's? Probably not as good. But pretty close. Yeah. Well, even CDs now, in some cases, are paying over four percent or even four and a half. Right? right. So, so yeah, you probably can. I think that my understanding of stable value funds is the same as you. They're in four hundred one k's only, and they have an insurance component because then if the market goes down, you still get your same payment. And that insurance component does cost money. So, so there are fees inside the the stable value fund itself. There may not be a purchase. Fund fee, redemption, redemption fee, fee, or will be one fee. There may not be that. I, I get that, right? But there, someone's got to pay for the insurance, and it's the people that own the fund. So there, there are fees in, in uh, Sharon in, in your term hidden. They're, they're usually they're not hidden. They're, they're but they're, they're minimal. But I wouldn't even care. They're minimal, and and it's in it's in what the thirty page summary document that you get. It's, it's they're hard to find, is what I'll say. But yeah, that you're getting a good rate of return. But I 100% agree with Joe. It, it's actually where you should pull the money out first, and then secondly, how you should be invested. And if you really are getting 5% or more, then that's a great place to be. Now, the stock market 
over the last 100 years, S&P has earned almost 10. Now, we haven't seen that the last couple of years, right? But uh, just be aware when you have a stable value fund, you're, you're giving up some upside, right, in the market. But what you're getting it's is safety. the safety, which, which is which is not bad. Yeah, risk and expected return are related. Yeah. I love 5%, especially for someone's transitioning into retirement or Me in too. retirement. Me too. Um, it, it sounds like she's not a huge spender. Yeah. Fifty five thousand dollars a year. She's probably saved a couple of nickels, yeah. you know. So uh, we don't know what her fixed income sources are. So how much of the portfolio that she needs, and we don't know how big of a portfolio that she has. Yeah, I I know she's she's called in or or or, or wrote us in the past, and we could probably do some research, but that's unheard no, that, of for that's, us. That's too much work. <laughs> we we just take them off the cup, spitball as as we say. So hopefully that helps. Yes, stable value fund five percent. Put more money into it. Keep it in there. Draw it out, but look at your tax bracket before you start taking it out. For a good retirement spitball, the fellas need to know four things about your finances. Number one, how much do you and your spouse, if you have one, have saved for retirement in tax-deferred, tax-free, and taxable accounts? How much fixed income will you have in retirement? That's number two. For example, Social Security and pensions. Number three, how old are you and when do you want to retire? And finally, number four, how much do you expect to spend annually in retirement, preferably adjusted for inflation? Don't forget to give us whatever name you'd like us to call you and your real location in case state taxes factor into your spitball. Then we want to know where or when you listen, how you found us, and of course what you drink because Joe and Big Al really want to understand your entire situation. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app, go to the show notes, click Ask Joe and Big Al on air and send in your retirement spitball as a priority voice message like the ones we just heard or in an email like these. Um, Midwest Fabs. Midwest Fabs. From St. Paul, Minnesota. Hello again from the banks of the mighty Mississippi River. Thanks for taking the time and shedding some light on my employer match question and directing me to the video links, white papers, etc. Dedicated to the nuances of the Secure Act 2.0. Good stuff. I have no idea what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> He asked you to do several shows about the Secure Act. Oh, did you send him a bunch of stuff? I sent him stuff. We talked about stuff that was available. So, yeah. So you and Midwest Fabs are like tight buds? All of us are. We're all buddies. Got it. Uh, after listening. Between um, the ears. Between the ears. Dedicating a few shows to the nearly 350 or so pages of the Secure Act embedded within the 4,000 or so pages of the spending bill was not a top of YMYW's to-do list. My questions are about asset vehicle location. Okay. So in other words, he accepts the fact that you were rejecting his request for several shows on the secure act. Yeah. Cause there's not much there. Yeah. I mean, the bullet points you can get from Googling it and you'll know almost what you need to know. Right. I mean, it, yeah, there's thousands of pages of just nonsense. Yeah, because a lot of it's a spending bill, which has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Right. I mean, the big things on the Secure Act is probably, you know, three or four things that we've already mentioned multiple times. You know, the yeah. RMB has changed, the 529 plan. Then there's some a lot of different changes to overall retirement plans, the Rothification of things, increased matches, you know, but it's not going to really secure every neighborhood's financial future or whatever the hell secure as, stands as for. yeah as it was illustrated yes <laughs> yep it helps a little it does um if one has a choice between. Uh, between, yeah, I, I i got that kind of took me off there bw <laughs> i wasn't sure what bw means uh, between I'm, b slash w that's, that's to me that's black and white <laughs> i i did black and white I, or between I, I, I had no idea what that meant, but anyway, you're right. That's it makes sense between. If if one has a choice of between a low cost index fund or a similarly structured ETF, does it make a difference in a tax advantage account in which one someone should use? How about taxable type of account? Aside from expense ratios, what else should one consider when deciding which investment vehicle to use and where? Uh, okay, there's more to this. I would think 
that in tax advantage accounts, regardless on how the underlying fund is traded, capital gains, losses, dividends, et cetera, it should not matter. But choosing a mutual fund or ETF in a taxable account might not be as advantageous due to the unwanted creation of potential taxable events associated with the mutual fund. Currently, a um, uh, varietal. Varietal? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Variety? A varietal growler six pack. Really? Growler. Yep. Oh, there you go. Growler. <laughs> I know what that is. Six pack from <laughs> the Skiltel Brewing Company in St. Louis Park. In a rotation in the basement fridge. All right. Yeah. Uh, it's got the basement fridge. I also have a new walking companion uh, named by the rescue organization, Jake from State Farm, to accompany me while I digitally, di- diligently keep up with the best podcast on the interweb. This is Jake from State Farm on screen right now. Oh, oh right. yeah. Very cute. <laughs> looks, right. looks friendly. Many thanks for the simplicity, real, and funny spitball wisdom you share on the Y Dub for with the YW YMYW tribe. Why the hell do I feel like I'm drunk now? <laughs> um, <laughs> but all that steel toe IPA. You, you've been uh, thinking about beers. That, that I know. <laughs> now I'm all foggy brain. <laughs> Congratulations to Andy for her newly bestowed title uh, by another YMYW listener of the Boss Lady. Cheers, Midwest Fabs. Yeah, she kind of controls us, doesn't she, Jim? She is the boss lady. Yeah, I try to keep this three ring circus uh, within the three <laughs> rings. <laughs> and you do a great job, or so we're told. Joe and I actually don't listen to the podcast because <laughs> we've already done it. Yeah, right. Uh, I can barely stand <laughs> making it through it, let alone <laughs> spend another hour listening to it. So well, I don't even know what, I'm, what's his what, question? The, here's the question. ETFs versus low-cost mutual funds, which is better in a non-retirement account, non-qualified mm-hmm. account? And mm-hmm. I would say ETFs are slightly better. To be perfectly honest, both are super tax efficient, but the most tax efficient would be an ETF because in an in index fund, sometimes the fund manager has to liquidate funds, you know, sell stocks for distributions requested by investors. And then that means everyone gets their pro rata share of that capital gain. So you get those capital gain dividends right at year end. In an ETF, you've got far less of that because generally when someone needs to liquidate, they've liquidated their own unit and it doesn't affect you. Otherwise, and that's not like a huge difference, but it is slightly better, I would say, to have an ETF. Yeah, the structure of an ETF is a little bit more tax efficient. But if you're in an index fund, just realize there's not a ton of turnover in index funds. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's not that much different. Now, if you're invested in an actively traded mutual fund, that's completely different yeah. because now you got a fund manager trying to beat the market and they're buying and selling all the time, which causes a lot of capital gains, which you'll have to pay for. Yeah. Or unless you're in this uh, fund company that is very large, uh, the Vanguard. <laughs> they did, uh, I think yeah. they changed like what to Admiral shares or they did something and then they, Every, I mean, people got hit pretty hard with the capital gain, even though they're indexed yeah. and they're very tax efficient. But uh, yeah, it can. So yeah, if you have a choice, all things being equal, I would go ETF. But yeah, certainly the fund expenses are very important. I'd rather go for a cheaper index fund than a more expensive ETF. Yep. We got Anna from Oregon writes in, goes, Joe, Big Al, and Andy, big fan of your podcast have a question about pensions and how they factor into asset allocation and overall retirement planning. My wife and I expect to receive a pension when we retire. She is a federal employee and I'm a state employee. I'm 36, yo, and she's 38, yo. I've heard some people consider their pension as bonds or save fixed income in their portfolios and then invest mostly or entirely in equities. I think you have suggested that people first look at what their income needs are in retirement and then subtract from that amount their expected pension in order to figure out the gap and they will need to fill with non-pension funds. Very good, Adam. You guys l- listening. Yeah. Yep. And we agree with that. <laughs> we are probably a couple of decades away from retirement. So it's hard to say what our income needs will be for now. Should we invest more heavily in equities and less in bonds? Uh, yes. Um, <laughs> or should we be less aggressive knowing we have that guaranteed income stream? Oh, interesting. Okay. We could take the other side of that, I guess. How should we be thinking about our pension as part of our overall portfolio? We'd love to hear 
you chat a bit about pensions. We're currently about 85% equities, 15% bonds. I expect my pension to replace 45% of my salary and my wife's to replace 33% of hers. I'm driving an old Ford until it won't go anymore. Recently lost her sweet dog, a Boston Terrier mix, 13 years old. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Enjoy a good hazy IPA. Thanks. Love the show. All right, Adam. <clears throat> great question. So he's yeah. looking at it from, hey, if I don't need to take on the risk, why should I? Or should I just put the pedal to the metal and floor it because I don't need this money for 20 years? I'm on the ladder. Yeah, have, I am too. Yeah, you have plenty of time to have the markets recover. If the markets were to crash, you want the market to crash. You want it to continue to be as volatile as all get out um, because the dollars that you're saving each month or each pay period or quarter, whatever your saving cycle is, you, you know, if the markets are down, you're buying more shares at a cheaper price. Um, I would be looking at loading up more on Roth IRAs because your pensions are going to be taxed at ordinary income. And then this will give you the diversification to have a higher income at lower tax rates. So if I was Adam and I was having a little lazy IPA or hazy IPA. Yeah, hazy. lazy IPA, whatever. E we either one lazy. is good. <laughs> yeah, we turn lazy after we have a couple of hazies. Yes. I, I would say go all equities and all Roth. Yeah, I, I like that too. I would go, I I would, I don't have any problem sticking with the current allocation, 85% stocks. You could go 90, you go 100. You just have to understand stock volatility, right? And if, and some people can't handle that, right? And if you can't handle it, then then back it off a little bit. But at any rate, uh, yeah, that, that would be the better answer. And then when you get to retirement, you run through that calculation that you already went through. Right, you don't even think about your pension. It just is what it is. Your pension is your pension. Do your shortfall, and figure out what allocation you need to have going into retirement, and then you're golden. Yeah, I mean, I think what, once it gets close to ten years from retirement, then you might want to slowly start changing your allocation, or maybe a little bit before that. Um, you don't want to do it right at retirement, but you know, you want to be planning each year. Of all right, well, what does the allocation look like? Are you on track, not on track? What target rate of return are you expecting each year to get to a certain dollar figure? You know, how did you do this year compared to last year? You know, what moves did you make during market volatility? You know, so this is an ongoing process. So, you know, some some years you might go 100% pre tax versus Roth. But as I'm kind of thinking out loud and just looking at a lot of our clients that have pensions that were good savers. Um, you know, they have these large pensions and then they also have large 401k accounts and they have nothing else. So a hundred percent of their income is coming either from a 401k plan or 403b plan, IRAs, and then pensions and everything is taxed at ordinary income rates and they're not big spenders. And so then what happens when they get a little bit older, you know, the RMDs kick in and then it's all, you know, then they're losing even more of their harder money that they saved 20, 30 years you know, trying to build. So Adam's in a good spot. So he can be a little bit more diversified and savvy in his overall saving strategy, knowing that he's going to have a fixed income source later in life, you know, to protect his floor and essential expenses. When it comes to investing, we tend to let our emotions and our biases cloud our judgment and influence our actions, especially when the market is volatile or unpredictable. We buy high and sell low, chasing the market trends and following the crowd. We overestimate our abilities and underestimate the risks. We are our own worst enemy. We could avoid all that. We just need to learn how to manage our emotions and stick to our investment plan no matter what the market does. Calm your nerves and boost your returns. Watch Emotional Investing on YMYW TV and download the companion Emotionless Investing Guide, our special offer until this Friday only, so get yours ASAP. Joe and Big Al will teach you how to overcome your emotional biases with practical tips and strategies to help you make smart and consistent investment decisions not driven by your emotions. Just click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app, go to the show notes, access these free financial resources, and share them with a friend before this Friday. Friday. Hey guys, uh, so you might be surprised to hear me say this, but I'm not sure. I'm not so sure if Roth conversions are good as they sound. 
Oh, this is oh good. okay. Oh, we're going to have a little point, cross point debate? Yeah, a little debate. Yeah. Like uh, I have an opportunity to convert $100,000 this year to the top of the 24% tax bracket. To do this, I would have to sell non-qualified retirement assets and pay a 15% capital gains on those to pay the tax I'd owe this year. So to net $24,000 for the tax on the conversion and have enough to pay the 15% capital gains tax, I actually have to sell $28,000. With $28,000 no longer growing for me, do I really come out ahead? I need to factor in the loss of 20 years of growth for the $28,000, don't I? Here are the calculations I did. Looking 20 years down the road and assuming money doubles every 10 years for ease of calculations. All right. So she's saying, this is Christine from Seattle. Yeah, their calculation. So she's saying, all right, well, here, I have this money in a retirement account that's going to grow for me. And then I have this money outside of a retirement account that's going to grow for me. Right. So let's, I have let's to, compare. Right. Let's compare because I have this other money that's going to the IRS if I pay the tax. So I don't think this makes sense to do a Roth conversion. Right. So. She's going to convert $100,000 and pay the tax bill up front, uh, yields $288,000 that comes out tax-free. $100,000 minus $28,000 tax on conversion equals $72,000 times two is $144,000. Growth of 10 years is $28,000. You follow that math, Al? Two hundred and eighty eight thousand. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. ten years it becomes one forty four. After twenty years it becomes two hundred eighty eight thousand. Yeah. Which I agree. That's 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 a that's a correct back of the envelope assumption. All right. If I don't convert that twenty eight thousand dollars that she would have paid to taxes is going to keep working for me, and I have five hundred twelve thousand that's taxed when I take it out. A hundred thousand plus twenty eight times two equals 256,000, and then 20 years of growth, 512,000. If my thinking isn't flawed, then it must be. It <laughs> seems I could pay a roughly 44% tax rate and still net the same as if I do conversions now. And I don't think my tax rate will be that high in retirement, at least I hope not. It's summer. So I'm drinking Mount Gay and Tonic with a lime. A lot of gin and ton tonic drinkers. You know. Read yeah. on. Yeah. Al, I think you got to switch. Start being a gin and tonic guy. I, I, well, okay. I mean, I like rum, but maybe I'll give it a shot. All right. Um, that's a smooth golden Barbados rum, by the way, not oh. gin. Oh, oh. so this, you're talking my language now. Yeah. Well, God, I just talked too soon, didn't I? <laughs> That's Andy's why Andy always, said, read on. Yeah, I know. It's not gin. Andy's always right. Don't knock it until you try it. Very smooth and refreshing. And Al might even like a little splash of pineapple. Oh, uh, Christine, I'm positive. I would like a splash of pineapple in that. I would vomit. <laughs> I look forward to hearing your spitball and probably make fun of my throwing all these numbers around and using terms like net and non-qualifying, like I know what I'm talking about. I'm talking to you, Joe, but I love you all anyway, and I appreciate you. Christine in Seattle. For the heart. Thank you, Christine. The, yeah, thank you. God, I must have just, like, blown a lot of people up over the years. Apparently. That's what, what seems to, but Christine still loves you. And, in fact, Christine, love the hearts. Keep them coming. We like to, we like to feel loved. Uh, all right. Her math is flawed. It is flawed. Agreed. What do you see? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know what calculator she's using. Maybe it's an abacus. Um, <laughs> well, I, I can tell you what she did wrong. So, so the, the, the 100000 you don't add 28 to it. It just means you didn't pay 28000 So let's start there. So the 100000 after 10 years multiplied by two is worth 200000 times another 10 years times two becomes 400000 not 512. But you take 400000 I'm just going to use the same tax rate that she used, 
Okay, twenty percent tax and four hundred thousand is before twenty four percent. She used. Is, yeah, well, she used twenty eight in her other calculation. Oh, because right she about. had to pay some yeah, capital gains correct. on the twenty four. Yeah, so same same right. So one hundred twelve thousand is the tax. Subtract it from four hundred thousand. What do you know? You get that same exact figure, two hundred eighty eight thousand, and that's true every time you do this calculation. And for people that think they're falling behind because they got less assets, you've got the same spending purchasing power because you don't have to pay the tax now how this gets better by the way is maybe you put uh, your investments in your roth that have a higher expected rate of return right or maybe you convert in a lower tax bracket and so you end up paying taxes later there's lots of ways that this can work but that's that's what's wrong with this calculation it's actually same same so to say it another way Let's say, because I, I want to use her example in the sense of saying, all right, let's say I have $100,000 that's in a IRA, and I have $25,000. i am going to keep the math even simpler, just so okay. doubling purposes, all right? Okay, okay. I got, got $100,000 in a retirement account. I have $25,000 outside a retirement account. So when I look at my statement from whatever brokerage house, it's going to say I have $125,000. So Christine listens to this terrible show called Your Money, Your Wealth. And she converts the $100,000 into a Roth IRA. The IRS is going to say, you know what, Christine, you owe me $25,000 for that conversion because you're in the 25% tax bracket. Please send $25,000. So Christine sends them $25,000. Now she looks at her statement and she only has $100,000 shown on the statement. So in most people's mind, they're like, yeah, why would I do a conversion? Because $125,000 is going to, to, to grow to a a bigger dollar figure than a hundred thousand. And I agree with that a thousand percent. If you ignore taxes, because now I have a hundred thousand dollars, let's say I converted it's in a Roth IRA, that hundred thousand doubles over 10 years. And then it doubles again. So I have 200. Now I have 400,000. Let's just say it doubles over 10 years and 10 years from now, I have $200,000 in a Roth. That's all mine. I bought out my partnership from the IRS. I can take that money and do what I want with it. However, in the other example, I had 100,000 in 25 in 10 years, that doubles. So my retirement account grows to 200,000 and my brokerage account grows to 50,000. So I have $250,000. So at that point, if I pull the $200,000 out of the retirement account at 25%, what is that? That's 50 grand. It's the same, same, no matter how you want to look at this, how it becomes to your advantage to have different pools of money is a, you get the partnership and the middleman out of the game. So now all of that money is hundred percent yours tax-free. You take the, un, the, the, the likelihood of future tax rates off the table, wherever tax rates change to, if they go down, if they go up, you bought the tax today and you take that off the table. I think more importantly, when you have a strategy that you can take money from different pools to control your taxes in retirement, this makes the biggest difference in the world. Also, there is no required minimum distributions in a Roth IRA. Also, as it continues to grow and compound, if you die prematurely and it goes to your spouse, it goes to your spouse tax-free. If you die, both spouses die prematurely, it goes to kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews, it goes to them tax-free. It is forever, forever tax free. So we talked about this last week. Al, would you rather have $7 million in a Roth IRA? I'm going to cut you a check right now today or $10 million in a retirement account. What would you rather have? Yeah, I'll take the 7 million any day because it, it's, I've got complete flexibility on, on pulling money out. See, that's the thing is if all your money is in an IRA and you want to pull extra out for a trip or for to buy a car and it throws you into a higher bracket, you're stuck. But if you got a Roth, you can pull whatever out of your IRA that you normally do and then get the rest from the Roth, stay in that same lower tax bracket. You just have so much more flexibility. Right. So you have to look at the purchasing power of the money, not necessarily what's on your statement. So hopefully that clears that up.
Uh, we're going to Sarasota, Florida here, Big uh, Al. Okay. We let's, got, let's do it. We got Brad. He goes, hello, Joe. Or hello, Al, Joe, and Andy. I uh, love your podcast. You guys are funny, informative, and always entertaining. I never miss an episode. My wife and I are both retired, 63 years old, and moved to Florida from Connecticut about three years ago. We love CT, but we're not missing the winters or the taxes. Right. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Uh, I'd be like, I'm not missing the winters. The winters suck. Um, cold. We drive a 2019 Ford Fusion Hybrid, uh, which we like very much. All right. And we are, and with all due respect to James Bond, I like my martinis very dry. And always stirred, never shaken. Okay. All right. Got it. Look at Brad. He's a badass <laughs> from Sarasota with a hybrid dressed as James Bond. All right. I have a difference of opinion with our financial advisor at it relates to Roth conversions that I would like to get your perspective on. Our retirement assets include $1.7 million in traditional IRAs, $220,000 in a Roth, $81,000 in HSA, and about $900,000 in a brokerage account. Our investments are mostly balanced between stocks, bonds, index funds with cash reserves covering two to three living years of living expenses. Okay, very good. Brad. Yes, very James Bond like right. with that portfolio. Sure. It's very big and sexy. <laughs> uh, I collect a pension from my former employer of sixty two thousand dollars a year. Uh, we are deferring our Social Security until age seventy, which at that time we expect around seventy eight thousand dollars a year. Plus, a deferred fixed annuity will get us right at one hundred fifty k for lifetime income. I want to draw down our traditional IRAs during our gap years. To pay the taxes now at our currently historic low rates, maxing out the 22% tax bracket each year. Living in Florida, we pay no state income tax. This amounts to about $150,000 of traditional IRA distributions each year. Okay. All right. So he's 63, right? And then he yep. is bridging a gap until age 70. Right. So then at age 70, he doesn't need any more money from the portfolio, it sounds like. Because he's going to have $150,000 fixed income. I'm just assuming that that's probably what he needs. Yeah. Well, either that or with his portfolio, but the 150 plus portfolio would be fine. Okay. Um, I'm allocating $50,000 of the $150,000 of IRA withdrawals to Roth conversions each year. Okay. My goal is to fund Roth while using the remaining IRA proceeds and the other savings to cover our living expenses. I plan to continue with annual $50,000 Roth conversions, at least until the current tax rates expire in 2026. Our financial advisor strongly disagrees with my Roth conversion strategy. His reasoning is that since we are drawing down the IRA for our living expenses during our gap years, the Roth conversions provide little benefit. By the time we are required to take RMDs, the IRA will be depleted to the point that the RMD tax will be inconsequential. Inconsequential, yes. yes. Yeah. Without yeah. consequence. Yes. Yes. Yeah, those big words always get me. We feel it's better to leave the money in the IRA and allow it to grow tax deferred until it's needed. Okay. Okay. He feels it's better. The advisor does. Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. Yes. Um, I'm not sure if that, I agree with our financial advisor on this. We're maxing out the 22% tax bracket with our IRA distributions Anyway, and I see little harm in directing some of the money to the Roth. The Roth will give us financial flexibility and the opportunity to pass tax-free assets to our heirs. Appreciate if you could spitball this for me. Thanks. All right, Brad, a.k.a. James Bond. <laughs> um, what do you think? Well, um, I first of all, I disagree with your advisor. But I think there's a better plan than even the one you have. I agree a thousand percent. Because you have $865,000 in a taxable brokerage account. Wouldn't it make more sense to live off of that for a while and do a $150,000 Roth conversion? You got money to pay the taxes. Now you end up with a lot more money in a Roth IRA. And then retirement at age 70 is much better from a tax standpoint. Remember, you've got $150,000 of fixed income, which is already going to put you in the 22% bracket currently which will be 25 here by 2026. So any RMD that you have on top of that. If it's a dollar. 
it's going to cost you 25 percent and you're probably going to approach alternative minimum tax which will be more like 28 or even 35 percent because of that that stupid expense that gets phased out with increased income so you're actually going to be in a pretty high tax bracket. You want to get as much into the Roth as you can. Yep, I would agree with that a thousand percent. Because let's say you don't do anything, you you, you let the IRA defer. Okay, so it's one point seven million dollars. He's sixty three years old. In ten years, he's seventy three, where he has to take a, a, a his required distribution. So what do you think that's going to be worth? Like three million dollars, I'd say. It could be even worth more than that. Three and a half million dollars. Right. So his RMD at that point is going to be $120,000 on top of his $150,000 income. Well, now he's blown up. It's like, well, don't touch the RA until you absolutely need to. That's the advice a lot of advisors give. Because why do you think, and I'm not going to blow up this advisor because I'm sure he's a very good advisor and um, he's helping out Brad. But a lot of times advisors won't recommend this because if you do a Roth conversion, what happens to the portfolio? Yeah, it, it gets reduced. It gets reduced. And how, and how are advisors paid <laughs> on the amount of the portfolio? Correct. So if you're converting money into a Roth IRA and you're taking additional money out of the portfolio to pay the tax, you are going to be better off, but the advisor may not be better off because there's a lower balance. I'm not saying that he's thinking of this at by any stretch of the imagination. But it's true. It's like you look at it. It's like a little bit more work for the advisor. It's like, well, you know what? Why even bother? Just let it continue to defer. You know, it's going to be great. It'll be fine. And then you're 72 years old and all of a sudden you're going to get your butt kicked by a huge tax bill. <laughs> now, I, so I'm going to take so I'm going to take the advisor's side here just for a second. Okay. Just for fun. So so he's thinking that if $150,000 gets drained from this account over the next seven years, Let's call that a million dollars, right? And so they, you had 1.7, you've drained out a million. Now you got 700,000. Of course, it'll be higher because of growth, right? Assuming the market grows, right? So let's say you got a million, so or maybe a little more, but let's just say a million dollars. But even a million dollars, that's at, at a at a 4% RMD rate, which is roughly what it is in the first year. That's a $40,000 additional income that sits on top of your 150,000 that you already have, right? not to mention whatever kind of income you have from your brokerage account. So you're probably going to be in alternative minimum taxes with the old tax rates coming back. Uh, although you live in Florida, so maybe not, but anyway, it's, you're going to be, you're going to be 25 to 28%, potentially even 35%. Uh, and versus right now, you're 22, 22. That's I, I would do the conversions all day long. Uh, or, I mean, or blow them out and do the $50,000 conversion. Who cares? I mean, I don't, if you do $50,000 conversion over the next 10 years, that's a lot of money sitting in the Roth that will compound tax free forever. So why would that be a waste of time? Right? I mean, let me do some quick. So over eight years, so let's say he does $50,000 over eight years. All right. And then let's say the market grows at 6%. Now he's got $524,000 sitting in the Roth IRA and he is going to be 70 years old. Right. right? On top of what he starts with, which is 200, which will grow also. Right. So let's call it $800,000 yeah. sitting in a Roth. Right. And, um, so let's say then that grows for another 25 years at 6%. Right. So that's a couple million dollars compounding 100% tax free. Right. No, that's not worth it. Don't do it. It's, it's penis. It's, I mean, what does what does this advisor advise on? You know, just multi, you know, billion dollar families. Come on. Uh, so I don't know. I'm sure he's a really good guy. For lifetime tax free growth on your investments, you really need to understand Roth accounts and how they work. Go to the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com and download the ultimate guide to Roth IRAs for free. You'll have valuable information in print, mind you, about not only Roth IRA contributions and conversions, but also the infamous backdoor Roth strategy for when you make too much money to contribute directly to a Roth. Plus, you'll learn the differences and the pros and cons of saving in a traditional IRA versus a Roth IRA versus a Roth 401k and the rules for taking money from your Roth account and much more. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your favorite podcast app, go to the show notes, download the ultimate guide to Roth IRAs and share YMYW and the free financial resources with anyone you know who would benefit. We got Dear Andy Big Al in Yo Joe. 
raving fan here, writing in from Idaho. <laughs> All right. Love, love, love your weekly podcast. You three are awesome, and I look forward to your banter and laughs every week. Yes, I have another one of those pesky Roth conversion questions. Here's our situation. Husband is 67. I'm 63. I retired two years ago. Hubby is 90% retired from a small business. We spent the last two years unraveling our life in San Diego. Oh, okay. It's backyard. Yeah. Or front yard. Yeah, it's, it's here. Right? Yard. Well, yeah, we're in the kitchen. Right now. Uh, in rebuilding a new life in Idaho. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Uh, we just finished building our retirement home, and we also bought a small farm uh, that is owned free and clear. Our annual living expenses is around $80,000 in current dollars. Hubby just started taking Social Security $24,000 a year. He calls it his whiskey and shotgun shell money. Ooh. Boom, Hubby. <laughs> I want to hang out with hubby. You know, have some whiskey and shoot some guns. I'm thinking maybe Idaho is a good place oh, for you then. Look at Idaho. Yeah. I don't plan to take Social Security until at least 67. That's $40,000 a year. Or at each 70, it's 50K a year. Uh, once that happens, most of our living expenses will be covered by Social Security. Until then, we are living on savings and dividends. Neither of us have pensions. Uh, we met with our financial planner last year, confirmed that we have plenty of money, and he even suggested we take a stab at spending more. Okay. All right. Like many, our issue is we have too much in the traditional IRA, and we'd like your spitball to whether our plan outlined below makes sense. Here's our current portfolio. We've got a traditional IRA, $2.1 million. Brokerage account, $1.3 million. Roth IRA, 220000 HSA, 175000 Simple IRA, 130000 Inherit an IRA of a million dollars. Total portfolio, $4 million. 100000 on the inherited IRA. Uh, I stand corrected. What did I say? A million. A million. Yeah. Um, okay. We are planning to start Roth conversions this year. Our taxable income will be around $90,000. We're thinking of converting around $185,000 to keep us under the $250,000 AGI. Our thinking is we'd like to avoid the net investment income tax. Also, since my RMD with the Secure 2.0 has been pushed out to age 75, we have a few more years to work on reducing that potential RMD. We're thinking we'll convert about $600,000 in the next three years. Then after that, will continue doing conversions, but in smaller amounts. Does this seem like a logical approach? Are we overthinking the impact of net investment income tax? We have funds in our brokerage account to pay the taxes, but we don't want to overdo conversions either. Our goal is not to convert all to IRAs, just enough to achieve a better balance between these types of accounts. We have no children, so we can spend every penny we have. We have three hunting dogs, two German short-haired pointers, and one Boykin Spaniel. Boykin? I guess. All right. So it says. My husband. Oh, there it is. I knew it was coming up. Ford F-150. <laughs> it's got shotgun and whiskey. Oh, I can see that. And it right? says big surprise. Oh, yeah. that's hilarious. Yeah, right. Kelly. And I drive a swanky 2022 Lincoln Navigator. Oh, wow. That's sexy. Yeah, that's totally cool. Oh, look at Kelly that, in Idaho. That brand new Idaho. Yeah. Car, yeah. That Navigator. You got it. That was my stab at spending more money. I sold my 2013 Toyota Highlander commuter car with 220,000 miles. And I just wrote a check for the new Navigator. That was a new experience, and it felt great. I don't drink often, but when I do... My drink of choice is an ice cold margarita on the rocks with salt. And I'm happy to say we found some great Mexican joints here in Idaho. So it keeps us from being homesick from San Diego. Thanks for all you are doing in keeping your short informative and entertaining. You are helping so many of us create a brighter financial future. All the best, Kelly. Well, congratulations, Kelly. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. Got a conversion question. Yeah. But here's, here's the deal. Two and a half million dollars. They want to convert six hundred thousand dollars in the next three years. Two times four, eight, eighty some. And they're going to the two fifty mark. Two fifty is going to be in what tax bracket? That's in the twenty four. 
percent bracket. Yeah, I like that number. Um, I would convert, yeah, to the twenty four percent tax bracket. Well, she's saying, should I stop in the twenty four percent because I don't want to pay net investment income? But tax. they have two hundred twenty. No, hold on. They have one point three million dollars in Roth, so net investment income tax. So if they're selling anything in the brokerage account, they have to pay a capital gains rate. Yeah, or dividends and interest. And so yeah, got that too. Then there's another three point eight percent tax on top of whatever is subject to capital gains. Yeah. And I would say it's probably going to be somewhat minimal. Yeah, right. I, I, here, here's what I would do. I would, I, I get your point, and it's a good point because once you get above two hundred fifty thousand dollars of just the gross income, you've got to pay an extra three point eight percent tax on your on your passive income, including interest, dividends, capital gains, rental income, and and the like. So then, it's if you could keep it under that, you can avoid that tax. But the way I would think about it, maybe even see what happens is if you take it to the top of the 24% bracket, which is a lot higher, just add that net investment and net investment tax in there and see what the tax rate is and compare that to your future rate. You might actually want to go to, what is it, 360? This yeah, year? but you got to also compute Irma in there too, because right, they're 62 years old. Yeah, true. But that's not going to happen for, well, it's going to happen. I mean, so they're, at 65, at 65. So they're okay this year. Yeah, they're okay this year. Yeah, good point. So that's another one. Because here's here's my point. They don't have any kids. Right. It's just going to be Shotgun Shelly and Kelly. Uh, <laughs> shotgun Kelly and Shelly? Um, hubby. I just called, just called him Shotgun Shelly. Shelly. Driving that Ford <laughs> F 150, drinking a little Jack Daniels. Okay, 2.1 million. So $80,000 is the conversion. I mean, is the RMB, right? Yeah, although by the time they turn 75, it'll be probably more than double that because there's 62. Oh, there's oh, okay. So you're saying that 2.1 is going to grow. So there's 62 RMDs in 13 years. That could be, it could be five, could be four million, four, four, five. Yeah. Or it could be two million, too. So <laughs> on the low end, it's eight. It could be $160,000. Their other income is how much? Well, their tax one comes 90 this year. So I guess you add 25,000 for standard deduction. So it's probably call it 110, 120. Okay. And then. So you add another 160 on that or 100. Yeah. So it's 220. Yeah. Somewhere in there. So you, you just got to look at what tax bracket that you're in now, where what you're going to be in the future. That the, the jobs cuts in tax act or the tax okay. cuts in jobs act. 2018. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. 2026 that's coming right around the corners so, I know. you know so you all, you, you got a couple of years until the, the low tax rates expire so <clears throat> i would look at net investment income tax add that back in if you wanted to go to the top of the 24 right maybe you just blow it out go to the top of the 24 percent tax bracket pay the tax get that money into a roth and then look at it each year yeah and I, say okay well here we're getting close to a medicare age i want to look at the irma tax the net investment income tax, and you put all those other added things that happens when you increase your AGI, and you put that in the pool, and then that's and then you, you put that with the tax, and you add that together to see what tax rate that is. Sure. So you put your marginal tax rate, the Idaho's tax rate, plus whatever add-ons for higher IRMA and the net investment income tax, and then you calculate it out to say, all right, well, is this going to be a lower rate still than where we're heading in the future? And if it's still a lower rate, you convert. If it's a higher rate, you don't. Yeah, that sounds complicated the way you explained it. I know. <laughs> but that is the correct answer. Sorry. All right. Yeah, just kind of babbled on there. <laughs> it's all good. I mean, that is the right answer. So uh, thank you, Kelly. And tell Shotgun Shelly. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's and, got a new nickname. And Kelly, I would say any of this that you're considering is fine. Stopping at 250 is fine. Doing nothing is still fine. Yeah, yeah, you're you're in great. Buy another navigator. <laughs> Buy more whiskey. <laughs> Play some golf. Right. Get some more bullets. Okay. Well, there you have it, folks. <laughs> it's a wrap. That's a wrap. We'll uh, see you all next time. Show's got your money well. 
2023 was an excellent year for Your Money, Your Wealth, thanks to you. You downloaded this show over a million times in 2023 and over three million times since the podcast started. You got us on several best of lists in 2023, all of which you can find in the podcast show notes with the likes of Ramsey, Borman, and NPR. Wow. Thank you, friends. This show definitely would not be a show without you. We'll wrap things up today with our funniest derails of 2023, including the mop, minus versus less versus dash versus hyphen, the beer fridge, beef demographics, the Bing Hamptons, and our favorite one-star review of the year. So stick around to the end of the episode. Help new listeners find YMYW by telling your friends about the show and by leaving your honest reviews and ratings for your money, your wealth in Apple Podcasts and any other podcast app that accepts them, like Amazon, Audible, CastBox, Good Pods, Pandora, Player FM, Pocket Casts, Podcast Addict, Podchaser, Podknife, and Spotify. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call 888-994-6257 to schedule your free financial assessment in person at one of our many offices around the country. As of this episode, that includes San Diego, Irvine, Brea, Woodland Hills, and our newest office in Davis, California, plus Denver, Colorado, Chicago, Illinois, and Mercer Island, Washington. You can also schedule a free assessment via Zoom to take place at a date and time convenient to you, no matter where you are in the world. Chances are one of the experienced financial professionals on Joe and Big Al's team at Pure will be able to identify strategies that will help you create a more successful retirement. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. Writer Floret RS Mott. Mo- moped. Moped. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's this guy. It's, it is Halloween. He's riding a bomb. <laughs> moped. It's only got one P in it. It's a moped, not a mopped. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty good. <laughs> what you write? <laughs> it's a mop. <laughs> That's a good one. Had it been before Halloween, you could have said you ride a broom and you're a witch. It's the 1980 Florida RS mop. <laughs> it's a pretty fancy mop. It costs $299. <laughs> oh, yeah. What kind of bucket you got? With? Oh, that was bad. That was probably one of the worst ever. That, that's got to go down. This, it's probably the... this show goes in the can. Oh, man. Beer equals Big Lake Brewery minus Hazen Blue is good. That's actually a dash. Hazen Blue oh. is an IPA from Big Lake Brewing. Oh, minus? Yep. I said minus. Well, yeah, it's a hy- well, hyphen. It's, it's hyphen. the same thing. Except it's a, it. oh my. Well, I don't know. I like, That's what I would do. I, I like, like Big Lake Brewing. I like, I like Big Lake Brewing. But, but I, don't, you know, I don't like the Hazen Blue. The Hazen Blue. But so I would have put a minus strike sign. Strike that. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Bob the Tomato. Now, if you put haze and blue in parentheses, then it would be clearer. <laughs> it would have been. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but he does say haze and blue is good. Good. Well, I have to finish reading. <laughs> yeah. See, I just look at one, one word at a time. <laughs> or one hyphen at a time or my to say. Come on. What are you just looking at a paragraph? And Wait, it's, oh, it's like, is... hold on. Let me see if this is a hyphen <laughs> or a minus. <laughs> Oh, God. Man, whatever. It's been a long day. Hyper accumulation phase. Oh, look at you. The big word. I killed it. Oh, I, I, I bet Jim was trying to. You know what? Because it's two words you know how to pronounce. Uh, yep. And there's not a minus sign between them. There's not a minus <laughs> sign anyway. <laughs> he goes, there's a contribution limit of 73500 Minus. Joe, this is a minus sign. Thank you. <laughs> Pre-tax contribution, less employer matching. I changed it to less just in case there was any confusion. Yeah. He's got minus and less in his sentence. Yeah, he's a little smart pants. <laughs> right. He's ribbing on me, which I enjoy. Keep it up. <laughs> uh, basement fridge. He tells from St. Louis Park. It's a little bit, you know, higher class, a little bit rich, richer neighborhood than when I grew up. We had a got garage it. fridge. Got it. <laughs> got you got to go to the garage to get the cold beer. Not right. The- 
Right. But I think, actually, I think about it, we might have had a, a, a fridge in our basement, too. They did. Well, there you go. <laughs> that was like for frozen meats, though. I think it was a freezer. I think you put right. a freezer in the basement and you put a beer fridge in the garage. Got it. Well, if if you lived there now, I bet you'd have a one in both places. <laughs> I would have a fridge in every room. <laughs> if I lived in Minnesota now, yeah, right. Oh God, I would you'd, have a liquor cabinet in every room. You'd have to. You'd be inside for <laughs> six months at a time. <laughs> uh, you're like, what happened? Beef, brief. Beef, brief? <laughs> beef <laughs> demographics. <laughs> yeah, we got some demographics that are a little beefy beef. over here. <laughs> What the hell? Where is this place? <laughs> Big Hampton. Big Hampton. <laughs> what, what, how do you pronounce that? I'm guessing it's Binghamton. Binghamton. It could be Binghampton. Bing- it could be Binghampton. Binghampton. I think Andy's right there. It, it, it's like, it's the Hamptons, but it's, it's on it's, the other side it's of it. The it's big, the, the big it's, side. It's the big <laughs> side. <laughs> it's on the other side. Yeah, uh, I live Bye. in the Hamptons. Uh, Bing Hamptons. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I can see that. Oh, got a little one star. Oh, a, a review, huh? A real good one. The, a one star. Okay, that's her love. Name. Yeah, okay. <laughs> love the one star. Yeah, you asked her, for it, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you did. Kevin, the accountant, he writes in. It's like this podcast is one of the few that is truly painful to listen through. Okay, perfect. Well, <laughs> But he listens through it. But then why don't you just turn it off? <laughs> it's like, I, I just can't stop. He keeps trying. I, got I know there's, there's going to be some garbage. There's going to be some learning here if I just keep listening. God, I'm, I'm an accountant <laughs> and I just can't help myself. Uh, I, I see things through. God, he's like, I, I'm an accountant. I despise change. In a moment of self-reflection, I told myself that I would rid my life of things that provide no value. All right. Okay. That's, it must be our podcast. This then. podcast was the first thing that came to mind. Yeah. Okay. Al in his toupee. I can stomach. <laughs> I have a nice one, don't I? Oh, that toupee is <laughs> badass. <laughs> I don't think you, well, you have a nice little head of hair. Up there, Al. Yeah. I've, uh, I've never had a toupee. Never needed one. No. Any yeah. hair plugs? Anything like that? No, never. No. no, it's original. In fact, even in my 60s, I don't even color. It's original color. Wow. You would, you would color it? If, I, if I you, might. You were thinking about it? I, God, you're I, so vain. I might, yeah. Uh, well, well I, have, I do have a TV show. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you are. I, I got to stay young. You are. A, you, you're the big time. Uh, though he needs to accept <laughs> hair loss. I need to accept my hair loss. Well, I, I don't have hair loss, but I appreciate appreciate you think I have a toupee. All right. It is Joe. Uh, that is truly unbearable. Oh, it's it's you. It's not my toupee. It's, it's, it's you. Uh, and I agree with you there, Kevin, the account. I know. I can barely stand myself. <laughs> Dude, why are you le- leaning so hard in your provided picture? I don't know why I'm leaning. That was just the angle. Of the, the angle of the photographer that took the picture. And I'm leaning the other way. Yeah. And I remember that photo shoot day. I do, that too. was like the worst day of our <laughs> life. She's like, get together. Oh, look at each other. Oh, grab hands. We're like, this and is she, awful. And we didn't use any of those. They put two individual photos, and we happened to be leaning opposite directions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I don't know who put this little collage together. Uh, this is the first time I've seen this. Yeah. It's just truly unbearable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're and you're leaning. Yes, why, I'm leaning. Why, why why were you leaning so hard? Uh, why does it look like you are chewing marbles in your <laughs> lower lip? I'm looking at the picture. I don't see any marbles in I, there. Well, I, I, I don't, don't know. know. I got my ass kicked a lot. And... <laughs> You've got a strong chin. Maybe I'm, that's what I'm it means. Unbearable. I got it. You no, know, I yeah. have no idea why I have marbles in my mouth. Okay. But now, if you've ever listened to this show, you know I can't barely speak. <laughs> Well, maybe and I do have marbles in my maybe mind. second thought. If I look at your left cheek, you might have a couple marbles. In yeah, <laughs> you got a big cha in there or something. <laughs> yeah, maybe I, this photo was done on a Monday morning, and I might have had a couple of beers over the weekend. I was a little bloated. <laughs> Could be. Uh, in your effort to be cool CEO, uh, you come across as a complete beta tool. Beta tool. That's what does awesome. that even mean? I don't know, but that's my new big <laughs> it's a oh, Beta tool. I love it. <laughs> Suggestion: Don't cater to Social Security corpse. 
corpus. Corpses. 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 Social Security corpses. I don't even know what that means either. Listeners. I guess people that are eligible for Social Security, such as myself. That can't identify a browser outside of Netscape. You remember he's, Netscape? Yeah. He's, he's so ornery. He's, he's so ornery. <laughs> Why are you so angry? <laughs> Be a bit more forward thinking. Sorry. I can't get over how creepy Joe looks peeking over to pay Al in the pod profile pic. Wow. Just angry. I need a new toupee. I think so. I need to get rid of these marbles. <laughs> you should spit them out now. I wish I could. <laughs> Terrible. Well, I know I have marbles in my mouth. I've said that myself. <laughs> well, apparently many... you look like it, too. How yeah. Many, how many times in your life have you sucked on marbles? <laughs> sucked on marbles? <laughs> I don't know. I'd... Maybe when you were three? Maybe, yeah, when I was two and a half. But, yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, yeah. But okay. nothing nothing here on Andy. You get left out. Yeah, apparently. Well, I, you know, I'm not in that collage of the two of you leaning, so. It's fine. No. I mean, half of it, this is how we look. Yeah. <laughs> That's just so I mean, and, and all I can figure is that it's based on the fact that you wanted so badly for people to comment on their one-star reviews, and that's basically all Kevin the accountant had to go on was our profile photos and what you guys look like. Now, do so. you think just went straight to the jugular with so that marble mouth and your toupee? So and with I, the listeners, too. It's like, God, Kevin. Yeah, he was ripping on our, our, our people. Kevin, it sounds like you had a bad day. I actually, okay. actually already forgive you. Yeah, have a cocktail, Well, <laughs> It's all good. <laughs> Try one of those flying trapezes or what, what was that? Flying um, flying airplane. Yeah. <laughs> that was what a you're talking trip. about. Yeah. Remember that cocktail? It was called a flying airplane. That's, I think, go oh, right to Oh, paper plane. The paper, paper plane. plane. Paper plane. Like that's that. right. Yeah. Now, go get a hurricane. Yeah, go get, get a, a hurricane. Couple. Yeah. Yeah. My tie, yeah, yeah, just make it a double. Just, just load it just up. Load it up. Load it up until you start feeling something. Just, it just, yeah, you just listen to this podcast over and over again. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, that was fun. 